Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Gathering Place online church service. So glad to be here with you today. I believe that God has a great word for you and me. But before we get to that, let's open up our hearts as we welcome the presence of the Lord through praise and worship. Hello, Gathering Place Church. Katie here. I just wanted to pop on and let you know that this week's worship might look a little bit familiar. It is actually from a few weeks ago, and that is because this week we have had some technical difficulties with the recording of worship, but we will be back on track next week with a brand new worship service for you. In the meantime, I still encourage you to participate in worship, to raise your arms, to close your eyes, and to sing out loud to our God. So we're going to go ahead and get started with worship, and yeah, thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Good morning, Gathering Place Church. I'm so excited to be here with you, worshiping with you all this morning online. And I, um, I've been thinking a lot lately about how awkward we feel when we're by ourselves, which is which makes no sense. You would think that we would feel the most comfortable when we're alone. But I know when I'm at home and I'm just watching a church service, I don't think to sing out loud. I don't think to raise my arms. I don't think to close my eyes. I don't think to worship the way that I'm worshiping when I'm corporate with everyone else. And I just want to completely speak against that today. I... I hope that you really take this time for what it is, a time to worship God, a time to praise God, a time to give everything to God and to put your own shame and your own embarrassment aside and to just let him take over and let him move. And uh, I invite you to do that with us this morning. So God, that's what we ask today. We ask that we ask that shame, we ask that embarrassment, we ask that feeling silly be completely let go in your name. We ask that right now you just fill us with comfort to close our eyes, to raise our hands, to shout out to you, to not care what our spouse thinks about what we're doing in the living room, to not care about what our neighbors are hearing through open windows. We ask that all of that be removed and that the only thing be left in our minds today is our praise and our worship and our appreciation for you. So God, we dedicate this time to you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.
There's a table that you've prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. It's your body, your blood, you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. There's a table.
Well, welcome back. I hope that you took the time to lift up your voice and lift up your hands and really let God know how much you love Him during that time. We'll jump back into worship in just a couple moments. Hey, I want to welcome all of you who may be joining with us for the very first time. So glad that you are here today. I am thankful that you found us. I really do believe that God has something He wants to say to you. We would love to get to know you more. There's a couple things happening at the Gathering Place. First of all, we are uh, doing relaunch meetings on campus right now, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Plus, you may be out of the area or just not ready to come back around. You can join us via Zoom as well. Uh, we would love to have you as part of this relaunch team. If you want to get into the ground floor of doing so something new here as far as what, what God is doing, being part of what God is doing with the church, we'd love to partner with you. I really do believe that God has called us to shape a culture of D discipleship and community and generosity and so we're at the very beginning stages of that love to get to know you more and see how we can partner together also this morning if you're prepared to honor god with your tithe and your offering if you would like to give this morning you can give online at through our website or you could also give by texting the word give to the number on your screen when you do it goes directly to the gathering place it, and uh, it, we are grateful for your partnership, but we're also believing God for him to unlock the windows of heaven, just like he said he'll do in Matthew chapter or Malachi chapter three, verse 10, where he said, you know, try me now in this. See if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you will not be able to contain it. And I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Who does he say he'll do that for? Those who tithe. And so... I'm telling you, I have seen the blessing of God, the provision of God in my life throughout the years as a, as a believer, a follower of Jesus. I've seen his goodness and his provision, and I want you to see the same thing as well. So maybe that's the next step for you in your growth with God and growing in your generosity is to begin to give or begin to tithe. We're grateful for it. I'm praying for God's blessing in your life and uh, that you will really see his hand move in your finances, but in providing for everything you need at every time for every good work. Well, let's jump back into worship for just a couple more moments and then we'll get back into the word. Let there be light. 
Welcome back, everybody. I'm glad to have you. Uh, we like to do something when we open up the Word of God together. I always encourage you, pull out your Bible. Of course, have it handy, right? Hold it up and let's say this out loud and loudly together. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open up my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. I want you to open up in your Bible with me to Luke chapter 6, and we'll get there in just a couple moments. And I want to share a little bit with you of my own story and how um, I got to where I'm at as far as my walk with the Lord and even in the ministry and what I really feel like God is calling us to do as a church. So many of you know this. I'm uh, pretty new as the senior pastor at the gathering place here in Folsom. We showed up on March 1st and got installed two weeks later uh, as the pastor. Everything was shut down. And during this time, we've been seeking the Lord. We've been preparing these messages online. We've still been connecting with people as much as possible, doing discipleship classes online, doing everything we can to keep uh, the life of the church moving forward. Because you know this, that the church has never closed down. Just our in-person gatherings were shut down for quite a while. And the church has never ceased. But during this time, it's really helped me to identify uh, some things that are so important. And to ask the question, what's the church all about? What kind of fruit are we producing? During this time, I've watched as the world has kind of, and you've seen this too, kind of uh, fallen into somewhat chaos at times and then just the fear that's crept in through the pandemic as, as well or the concern of a pandemic and and we would expect that from those who have uh little confidence in god that they would they would just be swallowed up by the fear or maybe the concern but i was i was somewhat surprised to see the response of those in the church who so quickly gave in to the narrative of what they were being fed that really just poured on the fear and people began to react out of fear. And I understand there's a very real um, health concern out there. So I'm, I'm not talking about taking precautions and taking care of yourself and, and with even the separation and so forth. That's a real thing. I mean, people have really gotten sick. People have really died. People have also really gotten the uh, COVID and had very little symptoms as well. And most people have recovered, but nevertheless, uh, there are those who are especially at risk. I completely understand that. And I don't think anybody, uh, well, still don't, we don't fully understand how this disease works. And so everyone's trying to figure it out. And, and I completely get that. We give room for that. Uh, of course, my concern is as believers, what conversation I was hearing that people weren't going to the word of God first and grabbing a hold of the word and saying, it doesn't matter what, what uh, report I hear out here. What does the word of God say? I'm going to cling to that. You see, as believers, that's our only hope. Uh, some people might say, no, 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 no. You know, you, you can believe God, but you have to use wisdom. I'm going to tell you something. Believing God is wisdom because Believing God allows for the supernatural power of God to go to work in your life. And so you're not limited by just what the doctors can do. You're not limited by what you can do. We have a God who made a covenant with us and he keeps his promises. Now, here's the thing that we need to think about as Christians. If we can't trust God in the little things, how can we trust him in the big things? For example, your salvation, <laughs> your eternity. Jesus died on the cross, paid for your sins, right? Resurrected from the dead. You can go to heaven and spend eternity with God when you place your faith and trust in him. And it has zero to do with your own works, your own effort. It has zero to do with that. It has everything to do with what he's done. And you're receiving that, right? We get that. What do you base that on? You base it on the word of God. And so either it's true or it isn't true. And if you're just hoping it's true, my guess is you're also trying to hedge your bets a little bit by, and I'm also going to try to be a good person and do some good deeds and so forth that'll, you know, kind of uh, balance the scales. 
Let me tell you, the scale, the scale it has been balanced by Jesus alone, right? In fact, uh, it, he, he didn't just balance it. He, he swung it the other way to where when you stand before God, because of the blood of Jesus, you are 100% on the righteous side. But if your faith and trust is in anything else other than the Lord, you will be 100%, not 99%, 100% on the other side as unrighteous. Why do I know that? Because the word of God tells me that. And so as a result, I've placed my faith and trust in him. You have as well. You know, that same faith and trust that saves you, the same Jesus who saves you, same word of God that reveals his salvation, is the fa same faith and trust that we need to cling to in the times of uncertainty or change or chaos or pandemic or war or whatever else is going on. We have to go right to the word of God. His word never fails us. And so as we were reflecting on the response and seeing not only the fear, but also the anger, the, the uh, frustration that was being expressed through lack of love and the bitterness and the, and the words that people spoke against one another as we move from the... Uh, COVID pandemic concerns to the social unrest, the, the protests, the uh, injustice that we saw on TV and all as all of this came to not really light because it's always been uh, at the forefront, but so many people, I think, uh, saw some things that shocked them as well. And then we had time to actually focus on this and people gave themselves to it. And we need to address these issues in our country. What concerned me is the narrative that Christians fell right into, whether that's turning against uh, other brothers and sisters in Christ or just the way that we spoke, we sounded just like the world. And, and so you might think, well, yeah, you know, people who might be speaking against this side or that side. I'm saying both sides because there are Christians who are uh, really trying to wrestle through where they stand and some are very clear where they stand that's great, but how you stand and how you carry yourself as a believer should still be led and guided by the Word of God. And so as a pastor, I read the comments, I hear the conversation, and, and I listen and I think, okay, those are the fruits of years of ministry in people's lives. And so if the fruit of our ministry is fear, the fruit of our ministry among believers is uh, hatred or injustice or disregard for authority or a dishonor of people of other colors, all of that right there tells me there is something wrong with our process. There is something wrong at a deeper level. And so we might be doing church. We might be uh, coming together and singing and shouting and smiling. We might have uh, economic prosperity, but in the heart, we have got to get this word down deep to where it transforms us. If there's any hope for our nation and our world, it's not by going and overturning governments. It's by changing uh, the heart of men and women who are in government and in the classroom and in the workplace and in the neighborhood. It all flows out of the heart. Well, what has the ability to change the heart of man? The grace of God. How do we see that? We see it in the word. We see how to do it from the word. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. I didn't grow up in church. My family, we, we just moved in different places. Uh, we weren't anti-God. We weren't pro-God. We were just people. And so everywhere that we lived, I seemed to have a friend who went to church. And so I'd hang out with them and they'd invite me to church and I'd go to church growing up. But I wasn't serving the Lord, but I, I learned a little bit about who he was during that time. Well, you know, fast forward, I meet this kid named John Sales in Stockton, California, and we become best friends and we're hanging out all the time. Well, his parents, they got saved. They were, they were way out in the world and then they got way saved. And so they were in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, prayer meetings, all of that. Well, when I would hang out with John, his family would take me to church. 
And then it got to the point where when he would come over to my house, I'd still go to church. And I really got brought in, almost adopted like a son to them. And so during those years of junior high and high school, hanging out together, the Word of God kept getting sown into my heart. Now, I heard it, man, I prayed, I, I was con convicted at times, but I wasn't ready to embrace Jesus. And it wasn't until my junior year of high school that I finally got to a place where I was tired of being on the outside looking in. I, I knew you know, I'd lay my head down on the pillow at night and, and I just knew I wanna get my life right with the Lord. Like these things I'm doing, the way I'm living, I know that the end result will be eternity without Christ, eternity in hell. I knew that, and yet I was struggling. And so uh, one time in March of 1993, I called John John up and I said, hey, are you going to church tomorrow? He said, yes. So I went to church and it just happened to be our youth pastors, I think second weekend there. He shared his story, shared about Jesus, shared about how he died on the cross for my sins. You know, there's about eight of us there. And so it's like he's preaching directly to me because I was the new kid since last week. And, uh, and after he shared his testimony and shared the gospel with me, he looked at me and he said, he said, Danny, have you ever publicly prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your, your Lord and Savior? And I had said a bunch of prayers. You know, I was like many of you listening. I grew up going to the church. I believed in God, but I knew I wasn't right with the Lord. And so I stood up right there and I prayed out loud, you know, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins to be my Lord and Savior. You rose again on the third day. I'm asking you to forgive my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And, you know, I'm 17 years old and I'm believing it, though, and I'm surrendering my life to him. One of the first things that he taught us when, we, when he would lead us to Jesus, right? He, he taught us to get into the word of God. So John Sales, his mom had given me a Bible and I still have that Bible today. It's this New King James Version. It's called the Transformer, but on the front uh, cover of it inside, she wrote the scripture from Psalm 119, 105 that says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And she wrote, you know, just a little prayer for me. And uh, that Bible right there had a reading plan in the back of it. And so I just began to read according to that reading plan. And I would devour that and try to read as much as I could. And there's little check boxes, so I'd check them off. And then my friends started getting saved and they were coming to church with us and we were reading the word together. And we would challenge each other, we would argue about it, we would do all kinds of stuff. You know, we're young, we're growing. But I, I'll tell you this, those that I saw who got into the word of God, they're still serving the Lord today. I saw a lot of people come to church and they got involved in the activities, they worshiped, they did the outreach, they prayed, they did all kinds of stuff, but they never developed the pattern of spending time in the Word of God. And so many of them are either nominal in their faith today or not serving the Lord at all. I mean, we saw hundreds of young people come to know Jesus during that time. I'm telling you, there was something powerful about being taught to get into the Word of God. And it wasn't for the sake of, of just knowing the Word. It was this, for the sake of allowing the Word of God to, to go deep into the heart and into the mind, to renew the mind, but to convict the heart. And so as I would read the Word, I would start to see things about Jesus that I didn't know. I'd see things about myself that I didn't know. I'd see things about other people that challenged the way that I would think about them. And it, through the years of doing that, through the years, God continued to shape my life and strengthen me. Now, this probably isn't the time to share all my testimony. I mean, that, that would come maybe at, a, at another video, another teaching time here. But I'm telling you, there was a transformation in my life. I'm not the same person I was before I came to Christ. Now, mind you, I'm not the same kind of person I will be in 10 years from now. I'm going to grow. I am on a quest to grow in my faith and walk with Jesus. Man, I am still on the struggle bus so often because I'm human. I get it, but I'm not only human because I have a relationship with God and I have a, a, a faith in Him. And the Bible says that I've been born again. And so there is the Spirit of God that we have as believers on the inside of us that means we're not merely human. We're not limited to that. We have a relationship with God. And what feeds that is His Word. Now, I want to uh, highlight this because we talked about the um, power of God's word last week and we shared some scripture and I'd encourage you to go back to that. But John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You know, Jesus 
is so intimately um, tied to his word that the Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God, it uh, became flesh. And who is it? It's Jesus. Because Jesus is everything God ever wanted to say. Now, I asked you to turn to Luke chapter 6. Because in my story, I gave my life to the Lord. And 15 months later, I became a youth pastor. Uh, graduated high school. And then two days after that, I, I moved up to Auburn, California to become a youth pastor. Somebody actually took a chance on me. And I didn't know hardly anything. But I loved the Lord and I loved His Word. After about three weeks, I had preached everything I knew from the Bible. And then I'm like regurgitating other people's messages. I mean, that's just what, where it was. And I, I just stuck it out as a youth pastor for nine years there. And then we became senior pastors I, after, during that time. Uh, met my, my soon-to-be wife and we got married and started having kids. And, it, and so for 13 years, we served in ministry there in um, Auburn, California as, as pastors. Well, we get an email from someone who had been mentoring Julia, Pastor Kimberly Dearman from The Rock in Anaheim, and she invited us down to, to uh, just come in and be mentored and discipled for about a year or two and see where it goes from there. Now, we were senior pastors at the time, and uh, some people might say, well, what, why would you need discipleship or mentorship? Oh, we needed it so bad. We knew that God had so much more for us than what we were walking in at that time. And so we believed it was the Lord, and we moved down to Southern California. And for the next 12 years, we immersed ourselves in a discipleship culture. And so this is a culture where uh, Pastor Jerry and, and Kimberly and, and the staff, they, they not only preached get in the Word, but they modeled it. And so through our discipleship process, which is called Operation Solid Lives, and through our daily journaling process using the SOAP method, S-O-A-P, we just learned how to get into the Word of God at an even um, greater capacity and how, how to get the Word of God on the inside of us, and, and not just to read it, but to really observe what's going on and to see and, and to learn, but not just to learn it and gain information, but how to apply it. So learning to read the Word, but to hear God speaking through the Word. Learning how to understand what He's saying, and then most importantly, learning how to apply it. And so for the next 12 years, we were just immersed in this culture, and we learned about how to dig into the Word. And the real foundation for this, and why we do this, is found in Luke chapter 6. And it's found in verse 40, well, let's start at verse 46 where Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you whom he is like. So Jesus, first of all, questions, Why would you call me Lord and not do what I say? That word Lord, it means master. It means controller, decision maker, owner. And so it's a, it's a great question, right? When Jesus says, Why would you call me Lord? Why would you call me your master, but I don't, you don't do what I say? Why would you call me your decision maker, but you don't consult with me? How, how can you say uh, I'm your owner, but, but you act like you're absolutely independent? That's what he's saying. And then he begins to really lay out, which I think is the foundation for the Christian life. Like if you wanted to sum up what Christianity is, I think you'll find it right here in Luke chapter 6. Whoever comes to me, hears my sayings and does them. I'll show you whom he's like. And he just, he, he, he gives those three things and they're so simple. But they're found throughout the Bible, this whole process of coming to God, hearing what he says, and then going and doing it. That right there is, is probably the best summary of what it means to have a relationship with God or to be a follower of Jesus or a Christian. And so he says, I'll show you whom he is like. And then he gives this picture. He says, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. So what's interesting is the person who comes to Jesus, hears his sayings and does them, still experiences storms. They still live in the same fallen world. There are still storms that come against it. However, because that person is like one building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock, man, when the, the winds came, the flood arose, beats against that house, it can't shake it because it's founded on the rock. You get the image that after that flood, that flood uh, subsides and after that storm is gone, that house is still standing. 
right now we are in a storm and we are finding out what kind of foundation we have. Your foundation is not on your perseverance or your endurance. It's not on your efforts or your good deeds. It's not on the economy. It's not on the government's ability to bail us out. It's not on a new uh, way of doing government. Our foundation has to be on the Word of God. If it's not, we find ourselves like the next person. When Jesus said, He who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Jesus said the person who, who comes and hears but does not do, he is, he is like that person with no foundation. And, and things, tough times will take them out. What he's trying to tell us is come to him, hear his sayings, and do them. The foundation, the solid foundation, is in the doing or the application of the word of God to your life. So this brings us to today and where are we at with the gathering place? I really feel like God is calling us to shape a culture of discipleship. What do I mean by that? A disciple is someone who comes to Jesus, hears his sayings, and does them. And so I don't know of any better way to disciple people and to develop this culture of discipleship than to, to beat this drum about getting in the Word of God and doing it on a daily basis. At the Gathering Place, we've developed a self-feeding program. Now, I believe strongly in the teaching of the Word. I think we need to hear faith-filled teaching on an ongoing basis. I think if we would take the time that we listen to the news and, and we engage in you know, social media or just surfing the internet and we would fill our eyes and our ears with teaching from the Word of God, it's going to change our life. I believe in the teaching. But beyond that, you have to come to Jesus to hear His sayings yourself from Him and to apply those to your life. That's where the strength is at. That's where God has called us to uh, develop the self-feeding program. That's why we teach people, do the, do the journaling. Get in there. Read the scripture for the day. In fact, this is what we do. We call it SOAP journaling. S-O-A-P. S, as you read the day's reading, you, S stands for scripture. What scripture jumps out at you? Write that down. O is the observation. What do you see happening here? Who is talking? Who's being spoken to? What are they talking about? What's the situation, the context? You know, you don't have to do a deep dive into the Bible just to read it and get an understanding. What's going on here? And then A is the application. How do you apply it to yourself? And by the way, this is probably the most important part because this is the foundation, the application. What is God saying to you to do? And so you write that down. Write all this down in manuscript, not bullet points, not just random thoughts. Manuscript it out. And then P is prayer. Pray. Thank God for His Word. Thank God for the ability to, to act on it. If you do that and you do it consistently, you're going to find that you're growing in your faith. You're being strengthened. Now, you do this on a daily basis here, and, and you are being built up. You are feeding your soul. And so when the storm comes, which it will, I mean, we're in the midst of one now, but this isn't the last one, and it's not the biggest one. There's more to come. And that's not, uh, that's not news to anybody, right? I wish it was all um, going to get you know, just smooth sailing from here. We know it's not because it's the nature of the world we live in. However, you can have a solid foundation. You can uh, withstand these storms if you do what Jesus says. So we are developing this culture here. We're shaping this culture of discipleship and community as well. And so I want to challenge you, don't just uh, spend time doing this yourself, but do it with somebody else. Spend time in the Word together. I was so encouraged. Last week, we had about four different people say, hey, I'll, I'll open up my life, and I'm going to set up a time to meet at a coffee shop. If anyone wants to walk through the devos with me, through the journaling, uh, I'll do it. And so we had about three or four different groups last week where, where they just met at the coffee shop and got in the Word did exactly what I just said, they read for about 15 minutes, wrote down, journaled for about 15, talked about it for about 20, and then there they go on their day. 
If we can do that as a church and develop a culture of discipleship to where we are getting in the word and we're getting in the word together, I think it's going to change things. It's going to change our church, but it's changing church from business as usual because the fruit of this is what we're after. The fruit of this is a house that still stands after the storm. The fruit of this is love from a pure heart. The fruit of this is faith in God. The fruit of this is seeing the miraculous power of God in our life. The fruit of this is seeing God intervene on our behalf. The fruit of this is seeing Christians reach out to those who don't know the Lord with the love of God. And, and while they may be swept away in the storm, reaching your hand out and saying, come on into my house. My house is stable, right? And seeing many people be added to the kingdom of God as a result. That's the kind of fruit that we're after right there. And so my challenge to you is stop just listening to the importance of being in the Word of God and get in the Word of God. If you need help, if you want to connect with someone about, hey, walk, this, walk me through this in person, we'll do it. We'll do it. I'll do it. We'll have somebody else from our church do it. We'll take the time. I believe God is calling the gathering place to be a people who feed on the word of God personally, but also that we would gather together. Listen, we are not having church services on Sunday yet. We're not at that point. Eventually, I believe that we will likely do that, right? Like relatively soon, I mean. Uh, I believe that, that we will get back to Sunday morning gatherings as well. But what's more important is not did we gather on Sunday, it's do we live this out more than Sunday? That's what's important. How do you live your faith more than Sunday? When you have to spend time with Jesus, hear his sayings, and do them. That's what I really believe God is wanting to say to us today. When I look back at my life, how did I get to where I'm at? I believe it's because of the Word of God. Getting into the Word and getting the Word of God into me has saved me, it's sustained me, it's preserved me, it's kept me, it's challenged me. Anything in my life that is not in alignment with uh, God's best and God's will, it's because there's a lack of, of yielding to the Word in that area. Maybe it's a lack of growth at this point. But man, I'm getting God's Word on the inside of me, and I really do believe He is faithful to His Word. It will not return to Him void in my life. It will accomplish what he sent it for. And the same is true for you. Well, that's all I have for you today. I want to encourage you to get into the word if I haven't done that yet because it will change your life. We have our relaunch team meetings. Maybe that's the next step for you. If you're ready to start coming back out on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., we have our relaunch team meetings. They are not church services. We're reconnecting, we're refocusing, and we're preparing to relaunch the church. It is not business as usual. We really do believe that God is doing a new thing. And so as a result of that, we have to align ourselves with it. And that's what we're in practice or in process um, of doing. So you're invited to that. We love you, praying for you. God bless you.